in 1985, there, I mean, there was just myths, but they didn't have the movies yeah. and the books yeah. and everything to kind of... They also had different media. Very different media. Very different kinds of media. They didn't have no watch, their loss. Oh! Uh, that was good. Thanks. You're smooth. Oh, septième heure, mon septième heure, dévoile-nous les mystères, les origines de ton art. Que les palmes de la création s'écartent et enfin... Qu'est-ce que tu fous là, toi Oui. Mais c'est bon Ah non, mais attends, là, ça t'a, ça t'a pas... Ça te, il faut que tu viennes me pourrir euh, jusqu'ici, quoi. Bonjour, John. Ça va Bon, euh, ok. Alors, très bien. Bon, bah, je, changement de programme, finalement. Euh, l'odieux Dr. No vient donc de prendre possession euh, de, ce, euh, de ce petit module. Il est de passage à Deauville. Hein euh, il... oui. Voilà. Comment ça va bah, Très bien. Enfin, jusqu'à ce que tu arrives, ça allait très, très bien. Il va... Je peux repartir, hein, si tu non, non, reste là, reste là, parce que justement, toi, contrairement à nous, tu as vu deux, trois films ici, tu vas nous en parler. Et euh, tu vas commencer à nous parler euh, de Drive, de Nicolas Vingin Refn, de Nicolas Vingin Refn, que tu as vu hier soir, qui était projeté, qui est projeté ici, hors compétition. Est-ce que tu as aimé Drive euh, ben, Bonjour à tous. Et euh, ben, Drive, c'était... Euh... Un peu le film attendu, un des gros, soi-disant des gros chocs de l'année qui avait fait un, un peu un tabac à Cannes. Moi, j'étais assez déçu par le film, en fait. Je trouve que c'est un film un peu trop maniéré. C'est très, très influencé par les grands cinéastes du polar des années 60-70, Melville, Mann et, euh, et surtout euh, Driver de Walter Hill. C'est, et donc, euh, et de Pékin pas de Guetapan, euh, c'est euh, voilà. C'est moi, j'étais très très déçu par ce film en fait. Au final, hein. c'est très très beau, mais euh, Gunther Harald, machin truc, il sait qu'il est c'est un grand cinéaste donc il se regarde un peu trop filmé, je trouve. Hein. Bien, d'accord. Donc tout le monde adore euh, Drive, hein. euh, Drive, euh, <rire> voilà. Et le Docteur No, pas comme d'habitude. Alors en revanche, Fright Night, euh, le remake du Fright Night des années 80. Euh, qui a été projeté également en avant-première hors compétition. Tu l'as vu Là, je suppose que ce n'est pas terrible non plus. Ben, non, moi, j'ai bien aimé ce film. <rire> euh, oui, alors, c'est la, une autre ah, grande mais... surprise. C'est pour moi le meilleur blockbuster de l'été. Je me les suis tous fadés. J'ai tout trouvé épouvantable avec un spécial dédicace à Conan, euh, Xena, la guerrière, machin. Et Fright Night, eh ben, c'est le blockbuster le plus fun de, de l'été, je trouve. C'est un film qui est... À la limite, meilleur que l'original. Et euh, paradoxalement, aux états unis c'est le film qui s'est pris le plus gros gadin. Enfin voilà, il y a des scènes choc. Colin Farrell est très très bien. Euh, Anthony Hitchin est très bien. Voilà, moi j'ai vraiment... Euh, c'est un popcorn movie euh, super. Euh, moi j'ai trouvé ça vachement bien. Non mais d'accord, ok. Mais euh, donc, euh, Take Shelter. Tu as vu Take Shelter qui est également qui est présenté en compétition. Très beau film. J'en ai entendu parler. Euh, vraiment euh, une mise en scène ample. Propos euh, social euh, très fort. Euh, tu l'as vu Là, tu vas nous dire tout le bien que tu as pensé de ce très, très beau film. Euh, euh, non. Euh, non, non, moi, je suis allé voir euh, Take Shelter un peu à reculons à cause de Michael Shannon. J'avais une très, 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 très mauvaise expérience avec Bug de William Friedkin, qui était une espèce de film sur la folie absolument épouvantable avec Michael, avec Michael Shannon. Et donc, on a le petit frère qui est donc Tech Shelter, c'est un peu euh, une trame comme le, le film avec euh, Kane Costner où il, il y a Dieu qui lui dit de, de fabriquer un, un terrain de baseball, je ne sais pas si tu te souviens de ce film, c'est un peu la même chose en fait, c'est un mec qui a des visions euh, cauchemardex que d'une tempête à venir machin et le mec il devient euh, complètement dingue, c'est insoutenablement chiant. Voilà. Ok, donc euh, bah, tout va bien, il n'a pas changé comme vous pouvez le constater, on est content, hein euh, très bien, et eh bien tu, tu vas repartir aujourd'hui oui, oui, oui. Et j'ai juste une petite une dernière chose à dire. Et non, je... c'est trop tard. Euh, bonsoir. Mystère de la création. Non, non, bien sûr. Allez. <rire> Qu'est-ce que tu voulais dire Allez. J'ai vu un super documentaire sur Roger Corman qui s'appelle Corman's World. Tu, 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 m'as, tu, tu m'as fait peur, je crois que tu dire sur Roger Carrel. Roger Corman, donc le, le pape de la série B US, c'est un documentaire magnifique, bouleversant, avec euh, tous les intervenants en fait, du Nouvel Hollywood. C'est vraiment le cœur du film, euh, tous les membres du Nouvel Hollywood qui ont qu'on commencé avec Corman, avec euh, spéci- une spéciale dédicace, enfin, un spécial euh, Jack Nicholson qui est énorme, qui est vraiment le fil rouge du film. C'est magnifique, c'est à la fois le, la, toute la grandeur et euh, le côté un peu loser magnifique de Roger Corman qui est accompagné toute la 
toute l'évolution du cinéma américain sans jamais réaliser ni produire deux chefs dœuvre absolus du cinéma. Donc c'est vraiment un paradoxe, c'est très étonnant, c'est un film magnifique, très touchant, j'ai vraiment adoré, c'est un gros coup de cœur, John. Et donc c'est Exploits of Hollywood Rebel de John Stapleton, si je... ouais. Alex, pardon, Alex, pardon. Stapleton. Voilà. Ouais, c'était, c'était mais vraiment génial. Euh, vraiment, je vous conseille, si ça sort en DVD, euh, jetez-vous dessus, ça a été super. Il, 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 avait, il, il avait été euh, projeté déjà au Festival de Cannes et en effet, il y a eu de très très bons échos sur ce documentaire. Euh, très touchant, paraît-il. Je crois que c'est Rurik Salé hein, de Man Movies qui a beaucoup aimé ce documentaire. Docteur No, on vous remercie. C'était sympa cette petite, euh, cette petite crochet par le ouais, festival. J'ai, j'ai vu que tu m'as remplacé par euh, un, un petit être diabolique, un petit lutin. Je suis, je suis très déçu, euh, John. C'est très frustré. Bon, p- non, pas di- petit, oui, mais diabolique, euh, non. Enfin, je veux dire, il, est, il, a, ses, il a ses heures. Il, il, il imite très bien Francis Ford Coppola. Hein. Ouais, j'ai, j'ai, c'est le Père Noël, j'ai, j'ai, j'y ai cru à mort. Hein. Bah écoute, euh, libre à toi de revenir quand tu voudras. Il y aura de la place pour une troisième ouais, personne. Non, 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 non. Reviens, tout, les fans de Tonight on Mars t'attendent. Tu ne pourras pas fuir éternellement tes responsabilités. Parce que moi, j'ai envie de te dire des trucs. Chers amis, les entretiens qui vont suivre sont en langue anglo-saxonne. Vous pouvez cependant actionner la fonction sous-titres français proposée par YouTube en cliquant sur le petit bouton rouge CC situé ici en bas à droite de la fenêtre. Bonne vidéo et vive le cinématographe I'm gonna end him or he's gonna end me. That's how it's gonna be. Check. Check, 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 one, two, three. Check. Can you hear us? Check. It's all right, you can stop checking. Check. <laughs> he, he heard. Okay. Uh, after I uh, read this script and I knew I was going to work on it, I um, I watched the original. I loved it. I thought it was great. Um, I still think it's great. I think it's a great, really intelligent film. Um, but I was not familiar with it before this came into my life. Yeah. Um, thanks. You, thanks for holding it for me. If you can do that all, my hands are tired. If you can do that all interview. Okay. Yeah. The same thing. I got the got the. Um, there you go. <laughs> I got the uh, <laughs> the this script sent to me for this one, and I loved it. Uh, I hadn't heard of the original until this, and then once I got the role, I went out and bought it, and uh, I really enjoyed it. Thought it was really good. I think th- there are several things that are that are purely uh, story wise. In the original, Charlie comes to Ed. Here it's switched. Ed comes to Charlie, and that really motivates Charlie's journey in the story, you know, because he loses his friend because he's sort of blind to what is actually valuable in his life and then spends the rest of the film feeling so remorseful and guilty and really realizing that his life isn't worth living without the people that uh, that are in it. Um, and that's not something that is necessarily a part of the original. It's more Charlie's just manic and, and, and terrified. Um, in this one, I think... Um, I think the original really brilliantly looks at the transition from sort of classic horror to 80s horror. And this one looks at the transition from, uh, or or rather, uh, looks at characters that are so saturated in vampire myth and, and, and sort of pop myth. Yeah, exactly. I mean, they live in it. And Marty said this when we were at uh, Comic-Con, they live in a Twilight world. And, and uh, it looks at what happens to teenagers that live in a Twilight world when they actually encounter a vampire. They know, they know about vampires. Yeah, they know, they know they exist. In 1985, I mean, there was just myths, but they didn't have the movies exactly. and the books them, yeah. and everything to kind of... They also had different media. My favorite horror movie. My favorite horror movie. That's well, that's because I, I've been, we've been talking about vampire movies, so I can list five. Right, I mean, five vampire movies. Five va- horror. horror. Oh. Straight up horror. I mean, would you, would you say The Shining is a horror film? Yeah, yeah Shining. Horror no, it's a... I think it's... Yeah, it's... it's a, Yeah, it's such a happy ending. That's that's actually... It's really uplifting. That's why I love The Shining. Um, yeah, probably The Shining, if I had to pick a horror one. How about you, Chris? Uh, the Thing, starring Kurt Russell. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Big, big old, big old fan of that. I'm a big old fan of that. I'm in so many interviews with you, I know. I mean, what, should I start lying to give you entertainment? Yeah. 
Um, have you seen Flubber starring Robin Williams? Yeah, I have. I went. I saw Flubber at the theater in L.A. The El Capitan. I got a little Flubber card. Nice. I did. Cool, dude. <laughs> Um, it depends on what the remake is. Like, I mean, there's there are there are films in the past that aren't perfect that you know that have great ideas and they're great for their times, um, and and they could be remade because it's such a great idea. They want to show the people you know of now and do it in a different way. But then there there are movies. I mean, like The Goonies or you know, for me, The Thing that don't need to be remade because what it is is so perfect already and it lives up to what it is now. Um, but saying that, I am kind of excited to see the remake of The Thing, just because I love The Thing. I hope there's more special effects in it than CGI, but knowing today there's going to be a lot of CGI in it. Um, so I guess it just depends on what the project is, if it needs to be remade or not. Like, I never saw the original True Grit, but the Coen Brothers True Grit was fantastic. So yeah, I guess on like who's doing it and what movie it is. I think also we as a culture, because it's a global global network, we recycle ideas without even acknowledging that they're recycled ideas. You know, like, yeah, you're right. like nineties crime films are essentially film noirs updated in the nineties, but all the ideas and the, the the conventions are borrowed and recycled. So now it's just like I think they're targeting the eighties specifically because that maybe because there's a, a relatability for so many people, you know. Um but I mean, they've always remade in the '80s. They were remaking, you know, Things from noirs mm -hmm. from the '40s and, and et cetera, et cetera. Thank you. Merci. Cool. Merci. Thank you. Nice guys. Merci. They were a great, great interview. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thanks. Yeah. I know you're tired, guys. I'm so. Well, thank thanks, you very much. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Nous sommes très honorés d'accueillir M. Coppola pour cette rencontre avec le public. Il est là pour vous, donc à vous l'honneur, n'hésitez pas. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for this opportunity to talk to you. Mr. Coppola, two questions about your new movie called uh, Your New Movie Twixt. Clearly, it's the work of a serial killer. That flamingo kid. He's the one that infects them. Are they evil? They're all into dark things, every one of them. They worship death. I want to know the truth. There are consequences. What choice do I have? Tell me all of the story. Can you tell us a little bit about how you came up with the story? And also, can you tell me a little bit about the uh, idea of the, the live editing that you're planning to do with it? Well, yes. Um, you know, at, at a, a year and a half ago, seems to me, I was in some festival somewhere, and everyone was talking about Avatar and 3D. And uh, of course, I. I, as a young person, I was very interested in 3D in the in the 50s, and uh, and there were there were several periods in which 3D was considered the big uh, uh, solution for the to get people into the box office, and yet it never happened. I know even Hitchcock made a film in 3D in one of those periods. I think Dial M for Murder, and it was never shown in 3D. So I said, you know. The cinema has a lot up its sleeve. I can't imagine that this beautiful form, which is so young, all it can give us now is 3D, because we've had it several times, 3D with glasses. So I began to think of, well, what can the cinema do that it hasn't done yet? And it made me realize that the question of, of live cinema is not yet uh, been expressed, you know, that because movies are digital files today, it means that you can edit the movie for your audience, just as in the old days a musical group would come to town and the composer, in order to get money, would have to go with the group and conduct, otherwise he wouldn't get paid. So I began to think that perhaps one of the future directions of cinema that could be really interesting is live performance, because, you know, the art 
has been uh, sort of recorded or dead since 1830 when the phonograph was invented and the, phono and the musical record and uh, the movies projecting. Uh, but it's, it's essentially not, it's essentially a, a recording, it's not real. And today, I notice also in the theater that I have rarely gone to see a play that doesn't use a projection or close-ups or some imagery. Uh, so it seems to me the theater is trying to become like the cinema, and maybe the cinema might start to try to come like theater, and the two will join into a form that is alive. So I find it interesting to think about um, uh, cinema as something that can be performed for the audience. If I were here and showing my film, I could present it to you like a conductor of an opera and uh, make it a unique experience every night. So that was an idea behind my, my mind. That, but the film, Twixt, Twixt is an archaic word that means between, between a dream and waking, between day and night, between you know, good and evil, we are often between. And um, it's a story that came to me in the tradition of Gothic romance, like Hawthorne or, Ed, or the great Edgar Allan Poe, whom the French saved, because he would not have been known had it not been for Baudelaire. But um, it's something I did, it's an unusual film, it's, uh, it doesn't fall, fall into an easy category. It's part Gothic romance, it's part it's part uh, personal film and it's part Roger Corman, low budget production, but not really because it didn't turn out to, to be low budget or look below budget. At any rate, it was just, just a film that I've made and I'm anxious to present it to the public. I think I like it. I like the film. I find it very unusual. Bonjour. Je suis là, je suis sur, le, sur votre droite, on your right, Mr. Coppola, I'm here. Euh, euh, je, je suis désolé, je vais commencer par euh, quelque chose d'une banalité affligeante, mais euh, voilà, je ne vais pas avoir 50 occasions dans ma vie pour vous le dire, mais je trouve que vous êtes un, un génie absolu. Et quand je vois encore euh, Apocalypse Now ou, euh, ou euh, la trilogie du parrain en Blu-ray, je sais que ce n'est pas vos films préférés forcément, mais voilà, je les trouve absolument flamboyants et magnifiques. Voilà, je ferme la parenthèse de la flagornerie. Et ma question, elle va, elle va vous paraître un tout petit peu farfelue et je m'en excuse. Euh, mais il y a très longtemps, dans une très lointaine galaxie, vous avez, euh, vous avez aidé un jeune réalisateur qui s'appelait alors Georges Lucas, enfin qui s'appelle toujours Georges Lucas, euh, à devenir euh, bah, ce qu'il est devenu. Vous avez produit son premier film, THX 1138. Et j'étais euh, curieux de savoir, vous avez abordé tellement de genres dans votre filmographie, et du coup j'étais curieux de savoir... Est-ce que vous auriez pu toucher au space opéra, à la science-fiction Est-ce que vous y avez songé à un moment Et euh, voilà, sinon pourquoi Et, et les, deux, les deux autres questions derrière très rapides, c'est quel est votre Star Wars préféré Et est-ce que vous... Pardon. Hein, et est-ce que vous achèterez... Euh, est-ce que vous avez hâte de découvrir euh, toute la saga Star Wars en Blu-ray Et je me tais. Well, I... Um... I love uh, science fiction. Uh, as a child, I, I adored H.G. Wells. I, one of my favorite films is The Shape of Things to Come of H.G. Wells, 1932, uh, that, that Corda made. Uh, so I have always loved, and, and Jules Verne, and, and all of this uh, tradition of science fiction, uh, even my interest in Poe, Poe had some stories that were also in that genre. So yes, I, I, I'm surprised I never got to do a science fiction film. Uh, you know, but sometimes films uh, types became sort of uh, popular and then they went away, like the Western uh, went away for a while, then it came back. But uh, I'm surprised I never got to make um, a science fiction film or a fantasy film. I would have liked that. Uh, 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 so that's my answer. Uh, well, that's my answer. Right now I'm interested in uh, uh, other things. I'm about to begin writing a, much, a more ambitious film. I made three smaller uh, contained films 
and I uh, feel confident now to go on and make a bigger one that I'm writing, because I like the idea of writing original story rather than to adapt a book. But um, yes, I, uh, George, of the Star Wars films, um, maybe I like the second one the best. Well, what the, it's hard to know which is the second, because there, <laughs> but, uh, there was Star Wars, which was very, very uh, exciting, but the second one, The Empire Strikes, Strikes Back, that was, uh, I thought, uh, very good. In a way, this film I was working on for so long, Megalopolis, was science was, was about utopia, so it was a kind of shape of things to come in the spirit of H.G. Wells. It was, you could call it science fiction, because it was about a time in the world when we were all doing things uh, out of excitement and uh, fulfillment. Uh, it, it was a utopian film, and then, of course, we were shooting uh, the second unit when the 9-11 happened, so it was hard to make a utopian film in New York at that the time, after, after the, uh, the incident of the Twin Tower. C'est toi qui as posé la, la super bonne question à l'entretien Coppola tout à l'heure. Sur Star Wars. Euh, Star Wars. Ah bon, pas trop euh, Non, bah écoute, c'était la seule question qui sortait du lot, donc euh, bon voyage. Hein. Ah, bon, bah écoute. Hein. J'ai reconnu ta voix. C'est pour ça qu'on se trouve de voix. Bah, surtout que la mienne est assez inoubliable.